Thank you. So, welcome. Hello and welcome to you all. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, I am Lisa Hill. This is Diane Tyres. We'll introduce ourselves each. I'll go first. Um, we are very glad to see you all in person tonight. We also have some participants joining us online or remotely. Um, so we're going to record this session tonight uh, for the benefit of those people who couldn't come out and be here in person. So when it comes to question time, we may repeat the question, we may clarify the question um, so that it uh, is more helpful to people logging in after the fact. Okay. So again, thank you for coming out. I'm Lisa. You may have emailed me. I may have spoken to some of you on the phone. Um, you'll see my information on the website. Feel free, please, anytime at all, any questions to get in touch with me. I am the program supervisor for the TESOL program. I'm also uh, one of four supervisors for the Peel District School Board Continuing an Adult Education ESL program and LINK program. So um, I have a lot to do with the adult ESL programming. Um, and a lot to do with this course, and they go hand in hand, especially when it comes time for the practicum, for the TESOL certificate and the diploma. Uh, the practicum takes place in one of our ESL classrooms, so at that time it would be me who, who would deal with all of the aspects of the practicum and match you with a practicum mentor and oversee that part of the program. So apart from that, um, any questions that you have, again, please, you can direct them to me and I will try and answer them to the best of my ability. And I hope you enjoy the presentation tonight. Um, Diane, if you're happy fielding questions as they come up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we're absolutely fine. If you have a question, please don't hesitate to stop us and ask us and we'll try and answer them as we go through tonight. Okay. Thank you. And I'm Diane Tires, and I work with this company, um, Advanced Consulting for Education, and we partner with the Peel Board to bring this program here. So I'm responsible for the course design and overseeing the quality control and making sure the trainers are trained and, and that type of thing. And then Lisa, as she said, takes care of everything else. <laughs> so what I'm going to do tonight is just, first of all, walk you through English language teaching as a career choice. And then I'm going to talk about qualifications that you need, and then, uh, then I'll eventually um, talk about the course that we offer here with the Peel Board in partnership uh, with them. And as Lisa said, if you have questions, just let us know. If your question is really just about your situation, just hold it right till the end. Um, but if it's a general question about the content, feel free to, to jump in and ask it. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, why we actually even have a possible career as an English language teacher. And the reason is a very obvious one that English has become a global language. It's the most global language that we've ever seen um, as a human species. It's spoken and recognized literally in every corner of the world. At any given time, there's over a billion people learning English from every age. They're starting them as young as six months all the way up to seniors who are learning it as a hobby and for fun. So um, English learning is taking place all over the world with over a billion people. And this means we need qualified English language teachers. It used to be that if you spoke English and you had a pulse, you could teach English. Okay? That is not the case anymore um, because uh, it is quite a complex thing. We were talking this morning, this morning in a session I was running that everyone thinks English teaching is very easy. It's actually not. It's quite complex. And when you add culture pieces in and individual personalities and different backgrounds, it gets much more complex. So um, we need qualified English language teachers, uh, which means those teachers need training. So um, that is why we have a whole possibility of having a career as an English language teacher. And there's a nice globe there that I forgot to bring up. <laughs> so why teach English? It's, um, it's a career that's very fun and very rewarding. I've been doing it since 1991, um, literally all over the world. Um, and it never ceases to uh, give me challenges and opportunities. It's always interesting. I am never bored. You've been in it quite a long time as well. High school English since 1996, I think, and then about 11 years. <laughs> about 11 years in ESL, adult ESL. Yeah. So it's a career that continues to offer challenges. Um, you meet people from a lot of different backgrounds, which is always fun. You learn about other cultures, other languages, which is also fun. Um, you develop your communication, organization, and presentation skills. So even if you don't stay as an English language teacher, it actually does give you a skill set that you can use in a lot of different ways. Um, the fun, a fun one is if you like to travel, it's a really good way to fund your travel. 
I traveled around the world for about eight years teaching language, so that um, it paid my bills very nicely. Um, another really nice thing is it helps your students achieve their goals. You see your you see the outcomes of your work very quickly um, as your students learn English and as they get jobs, as they advance in their careers, as they get into colleges and universities. So you do see a lot of immediate reward, um, which is really nice, and it's just fun. Um, if you're a people person, you're constantly interacting with people and learning about them. So it's just a really, really enjoyable profession. In English language teaching, there are lots of acronyms, as there are in just about every industry. So you'll see all of these. So TESL, which is used mostly in Ontario, um, is teaching English as a second language. So that means you're teaching people who are living in an English language speaking country. So for example, Canada. And they need English in order to integrate it into the society, be successful getting jobs, and, and so on. Um, then you'll see TEFL, which is teaching English as a foreign language. And that's when you go to a country where English is not spoken as a first language. And so students learn English in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, they speak another language. They speak their own language. Okay? Um, then you'll see TESOL. And this is the one that we use for our courses because this means both this one and this one. Okay? It just means teaching English. And then another one that just means teaching English is ELT. This one's popular in England and Europe, so you'll hear that one a lot um, over, over there. And then you'll hear this one at Western Canada, T-E-A-L, teaching English as an additional language, okay? which just means you're adding it. The problem with here is many of our students are learning a third, fourth, or a fifth language. It's not really their second language, so this one kind of acknowledges that. But they all essentially do mean the same thing. They all mean teaching English. So there are opportunities to teach English in Canada and overseas. So how many people are thinking of teaching English here in Canada? Okay, and how many people are thinking of teaching overseas? Okay, so we've got a bit of both, so I will talk about both. So first of all, I'll talk about teaching in Canada. So there's a lot of different places where you can get jobs teaching English, okay? So the first one is what we call private language schools. So these are businesses and people, uh, students pay tuition fees to go there and learn English. And they'll, learn, they'll study for anywhere from two weeks up to a full year. Okay. There are about 150 of these in the greater Toronto, in, in downtown Toronto alone. In Mississauga, there's three. I just learned about a new one today. Um, so there's three here. There's a couple in the Oakville, Burlington, Hamilton area. But the majority of these are in the downtown core. Okay. Um, then there's also summer camps and immersion programs. So these are usually run by uh, school boards. Um, sometimes they're run by private companies. But these are for usually for teenagers. Um, 12, 13 is usually the youngest age you'll see all the way up to 17. And these kids come over to Canada for anywhere from two weeks to eight weeks. And they do kind of like a summer camp but to learn English. But they'll also do things like they'll learn how to canoe. They'll do some swimming. They'll learn other Canadian sports, they'll do tourist um, activities, go to Niagara Falls and so on. So it's partly English language learning and just partly fun. Okay? So you'll see um, some of those. Then there are employers who um, have a lot of uh, English learners as their employees and they will actually hire language teachers to uh, teach lessons within the workplace. So that's another place that you'll see um, teaching in Canada. And then you'll see what we call government-funded programs, and I'm going to get Lisa to talk about those because that's what she oversees these two here. Yeah, so the first one, Language Instruction for Newcomers to Canada, is federally funded. It's run by um, the federal government, and it's their mandate to support newcomers to the country who have come to the country as permanent residents. Um, so the classes are uh, usually quite small in number, about 20 students, they're full-time usually, the students are offered transportation assistance, so it's a big incentive to try and get newcomers to the country learning English as quickly as possible so that they settle a little bit more comfortably. Um, ESL is the provincially funded equivalent of LINC, so the province would fund our English as a second language classes. There's many, many more of these, um, but they basically have the same mandate as the federally funded programs. There's usually a few more students in these classes, 30 to 35. But the curriculums are pretty much identical uh, for LINC and for ESL, and basically they both do the same thing. They prepare newcomers, and even individuals who've been in the country for a long time, even Canadian citizens, uh, they prepare them for better jobs, uh, better interaction with 
their families, with their children especially, who are growing up in Canada and who speak English very long, typically. Uh, so here we have about 2,000, 1,200 to 2,000 students every year, uh, two semesters a year plus summer school. So there's lots and lots and lots of learners wanting to come to ESL classes. And of course, as immigration continues and newcomers come to the country every year, then we just keep going. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, then there's also opportunities at universities and colleges. So in this area, we've got the University of Toronto, Mississauga, um, Sheridan College, then you go downtown, you've got University of Toronto, you go the other way, you've got Guelph, Waterloo, um, McMaster in Hamilton, Mohawk College in Hamilton. They will all have what we call English for academic purposes. So what you're doing is you're helping international students get the academic language skills in order to be successful in Canadian higher education. So you'll teach things like academic writing, listening to lectures, participating in seminars, making presentations, things like that. Um, so that's a growing area. Then there's a lot of opportunity for private tutoring, especially now with the internet. Um, people will contract you just as a freelancer to give them um, private language instruction over Skype or any other type of video streaming um, service. And then there's also um, a lot of online opportunities. This is also increasing rapidly. There's com companies that will hire you um, to teach either one individual or group, small groups or sometimes entire classes of 60 students. And your, your image is projected in front of a class and you're here in, in Canada and your students are in China. Uh, most of these companies are Chinese based. Um, so this one you have to teach either late at night or very early in the morning, um, but you teach from your computer and they provide all of the curriculum and all of the materials. Okay? So with, um, technology is really opening up a lot of opportunities as well. So talking money and benefits and all of that wonderful stuff, so there's huge variation in terms of rates of pay okay, and work conditions. So there's everything from substitute teaching to part-time contracts to full-time contracts to long-term contracts, um, huge variation. The lowest you'll see is tw about $20 an hour, and this is mostly for the online teaching, you'll see that. Um, but it's quite nice to get paid $20 an hour to sit in front of your computer and you just have to look professional from here up and have your hands <laughs> on um, from here down. Um, so, and then private language schools are somewhere between $25 and $35 an hour. Um, publicly funded programs are near the, the $40 and change. Okay. And um, for new supply teachers. Okay, so around the 40, 35 to $40 for yeah. publicly funded programs. Colleges and universities are at the highest level. This is actually inched up a little bit. Um, you'll be anywhere from about 45 up to 60, 65 at colleges and universities. Okay. Um, the average newly certified teacher will come in about $25 an hour. What you do is you, you start out, you get your certification, you get your foot in the door by substitute teaching um, and by working in the private language schools or in tutoring or online companies. Once you get some experience, then you go into the government funded programs and then you might go into the colleges and universities. So you kind of work your way up the pay scale um, and you also work your way in the door by subbing first and then getting part-time stuff and so on. So, Please don't think that you're automatically going to walk into a wonderfully lucrative full-time position after this. You won't. Okay? You, have to, you have to get your foot in the door and then just work your way up. Um, working hours vary. Uh, you run classes like... So full-time so. week would be 25 hours. Okay. Um, there are teachers working more than that. They work morning, afternoon, night, and Saturday, some of them. Goodness knows how they do that. Yeah, but, we're, yeah we're for that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a, a full-time permanent position would be at least 25 hours a week okay. with us. And so you can teach morning, afternoon, evening. As Lisa mentioned, you can teach weekends. Um, if you do the online stuff, you're teaching at 12 o'clock at night. If you're a night owl, those are perfect positions to do. Um, and then vacations also vary. Some of the programs will close down for a certain number of weeks. Some will keep going um, 365 days a year. Um, and contract conditions also vary. Um, some will have short-term contracts, long-term contracts, and so on. So it's totally okay when you're inquiring about a position to ask about all of this stuff. Okay? So ask about rate of pay, ask about working hours, ask about contract conditions, and so on, because there's huge variation out there. Um, teaching overseas, there's an equally wide range of opportunities. So. We've got a lot of private language schools overseas as well. People have started businesses for language teaching. 
Um, you've got what I call the mom and pop schools where it's individually owned um, by a family or one or two business people. Then you've got large national school chains, so you'll find them across the entire country. Then you've got uh, international school chains, you'll find them in most major cities all over the world. This is uh, exa an example is English First EF. They're in almost every um, major country. Another one is Euro Centers. Um, they're global, uh, Berlitz is global, and so on. Okay, so a lot of uh, private businesses are going into this. A booming market right now is nursery schools and kindergartens. People want their um, kids learning English. The youngest I heard was about six months. Um, not quite sure what a six month old can learn, but there you go. <laughs> um, so anywhere from, usually these are three to five um, your age ranges. There's a, a lot of demand, uh, mostly it, um, in the Asian countries, you'll see that, but it's expanding in other countries as well. So if you like arts and crafts, making puppets, uh, singing and dancing and making a complete fool of yourself, this is the type of opportunity mm -hmm. to, uh, to explore. And there's a lot more. Um, pretty much all of the school education systems internationally have English teachers of one kind or another. So you can teach in elementary schools, junior high schools, high schools, you can teach in colleges, technical colleges, junior colleges. Um, a really interesting one is companies and businesses. So large multinational companies, Samsung is a good example, will actually have their own English language schools. And they put their executives through um, a very tailored language instruction. Okay? Um, so you'll find this uh, in a lot of any, any large multinational company. You can find opportunities there. And universities. So yeah, an interesting thing is happening a lot of in, Universities outside of English-speaking countries are actually now changing to, to deliver their university lectures in English. So lecturers who used to, for example, lecture in Spanish or in German or in um, what it, Portuguese, they now have to deliver their lectures in English. And students also have to demonstrate a certain level of English in order to graduate. Okay? So there's a lot of opportunity internationally at universities. And once again, the contracts and compensation vary considerably. Okay, um, these probably I need to bump up a little bit, but still the highest paid and kind of most stable areas to go to would be Japan and South Korea. Um, they're not super super um, high salaries, but they're they're fairly um, stable. China's an interesting one. They're desperate for good teachers, um, but you'll see everything from very low amounts to very high amounts. In the large urban areas, you'll see the much higher amounts, and then in the smaller rural areas, the lower amounts. Um, the interesting thing about China is, especially in the rural areas, the cost of living is almost zero. So whatever you make basically goes in your pocket. Um, whereas if you're somewhere like Japan or Korea, you have to rein in your spending because it's very easy to burn your whole salary. Um, Europe, uh, Spain's just an example. Europe tends not to be super high, but you get to, to obviously live in Europe. Um, getting into Europe, you need a European Union passport. Um, they will not hire you from Canada and provide a visa for you. So if you've got a European passport, uh, this is a good opportunity. Otherwise, it's a very difficult opportunity. Except if you are under, usually under either 25 or 30, there are some programs for young people um, where you can go and be an, an English language assistant in their public school system. So Spain has this and France has this, um, but unfortunately, once you get to ripe old ages like mine, you don't qualify. So there's an age limit on those, okay? Um, the Gulf region, there's still a lot of opportunity. It's not quite as um, lucrative as it used to be, but there are still a lot of English teaching opportunities in the Gulf region, like you know, the UAE, Saudi, Bahrain, Qatar. Um, there's opportunity there. Uh, South and Central America, there's opportunity, but it's not the greatest money, but you're nice and warm. So if you're looking for somewhere to be warm, check out uh, these countries as well. Yep. So can you repeat what you said about Spain and France? What was that? Yeah, so Spain and France, if you're, um, I don't know the exact cutoff, if, but if you're under either 25 or 30, they have um, assistant English language teaching program um, positions. So they place you in a public school and you uh, work with the different public school classes. You're kind of like the, the English speaker that um, helps them with their their, their spoken English. Um, so these are programs um, that run year round. I think they usually start in September and then you're there for at least a full academic year. Yeah. So Spain has that and France has that and also Japan has it and Korea has it. So if you just Google Spain English language teaching assistant program, it should bring up what you're looking for. But you don't get a teacher visa. 
position? No, it's not a teacher position yet. Yeah. But it is a really good way into those countries if you don't have that European passport. Um, the money and the taxes, it all varies. So whenever you're looking at an international contract, always ask the question. So ask, what are the taxes? It'll go from zero. Um, it used to be zero in the Gulf region, but they've just introduced the taxing there, um, up to about 20%. Working hours vary considerably. You'll go anywhere from 20 hours a week to 40 hours a week. Airfare, try and negotiate for it to be paid. Um, very often, they'll reimburse you after you stay for a certain amount of time. So you pay your airfare up front, you work for six months, and then they reimburse your airfare, because it does cost them money um, to keep you on board. Accommodation is sometimes provided, sometimes not. Um, see if they can at least help you find good accommodation. Uh, medical insurance is usually included. Never, 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 never step out of Canada without your medical insurance. Okay? And make sure they've paid it, make sure you've got your medical card, and make sure you are covered. Because I have seen the worst case scenarios, people have had extremely bad accidents, and they've been on the hook, and their families have been on the hook for literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, do not do anything without this. Okay. Um, vacation ranges from two weeks in the mom and pop language schools and the national language school chains um, up to 10 weeks in the universities. Okay, so you'll see some difference there. Most contracts are usually one year. If you're looking for something short like three months or six months, they're very hard to come by um, because it does cost money for these schools to recruit you, bring you over, train you, uh, make sure that you're on your feet. So a minimum of one year is what they're looking for in order for them to recoup the cost of, of recruiting you, okay? Um, and there's usually a completion bonus. So if you stay for the full year, they'll um, give you an additional month's salary. So you get 13 months of salary for 12 months of work, okay? Or if you sign up for a second year, then we'll, they'll give you a, a one month signing bonus, okay? So there's a few things to try and negotiate there as well. Okay. Any questions on that? So the thing is, ask questions about your contract I'm also asked to talk to teachers who have worked for that company in the past so you, so you know it's a legitimate company, okay? And if you just Google online, there's a couple of websites that have kind of blacklisted language schools that have not treated teachers well, so just do a Google for that and make sure that the school you're looking at is not on that list. Um, sorry, as a Canadian student in Belgium, do you pay Canadian taxes when you work? Yeah, it's a really good question, and the answer is yes, you should. Okay. Whether you choose to report it is up to you, but legally you are supposed to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you just have to report it as income. Um, and some of the countries will have a tax agreement with Canada, so you don't pay double taxes, so you don't pay that, that country plus Canada. Um, but it's, some, it's something to always find out about. Yeah. There used to be a system that if you were outside of Canada for a certain amount of time and you declared non-residency, you didn't have to pay taxes, but I'm not sure if that's still in effect. Okay, one of the things you have to consider, and we cannot help you with this, is whether you personally have the qualities to be a good language teacher, okay? So some of the qualities that employers like Lisa look for is, are you professional? Okay, that means do you come to work on time? Are you reliable? Do you dress professionally? Do you speak professionally? Do you treat your students professionally? Um, reliable, articulate, so can you speak clearly? Uh, if you mumble, things like that, you need to try and get yourself out of that habit. Um, patience is huge. Okay, because your students trying to get a language out, it's, it's very challenging for them and you just kind of have to wait and let them get their language out. You have to be friendly and personable. If you do not like people, do not look at this job. Okay? <laughs> look for a different career. Because this is a people job. Okay? You have to be open-minded. You're going to meet lots of people that you might think, uh, not the type of person I, I want to be meeting. They might have values that, does, that don't match, match with your values. Um, they might have beliefs that don't match with your beliefs, but you just have to accept it because people come in all different, uh, from all different walks of life, have all different values, and this is a profession where you meet that right up front. Okay? So you have to be open-minded. You have to be interested in other cultures because you will encounter those in the classroom. You also have to be a good listener. Once again, because language students really struggle to get their language out, you have to listen very, very carefully. And you get very good at interpreting uh, the language that your students produce to figure out what they do actually want to say, and then you give it back to them. Okay, so you have to be a good listener. We can't help you with this, but you do have to do a bit of a self-analysis and see if this is a good fit for you. Okay? Then we come to qualifications. 
So obviously you need a strong command of English. It does not matter if English is your first language, second language, third, fourth, fifth language, but you just have, have, have to have a strong command of English. Um, if English is not your first language, you do need to demonstrate that you've got that command of English. And the best way to do that is through a standardized English language test, um, IELTS. Okay, we always recommend IELTS. You can also do TOEFL. Okay. Um, if you've completed an undergraduate degree in Canada, that also serves as your English language proficiency. Okay. And there's a few other ways, so if you're in that category, um, come and talk to us after and we can direct you to, to how you can best demonstrate the command of English that you have. Um, the absolute minimum is you need a high school education, okay? um, whatever would get you into higher education. However, for jobs in Canada, you need a minimum of a university degree. And for the majority of jobs internationally, you also need an undergraduate degree. Some countries will take you with a college diploma. Um, for example, China and then parts of Europe, you can also teach with a college diploma. But the majority of, of uh, jobs require an undergraduate degree. It doesn't matter what subject it's in. It could be engineering, it could be nursing, it could be business, finance, history, geography, it doesn't matter, but you need that undergraduate degree. Okay? And then a TESOL certificate, such as the one that we offer, is recommended, but in most positions it's required. Okay? So if you want to teach in anywhere in Canada, it's required. In the majority of countries, in order to secure your visa, it's also required. Okay? There are other reasons to take a TESOL course, not just because employers require it. Um, the course gives you tools, strategies, skills, and knowledge to be successful. Um, if you're going to be serious about teaching English, you need to make sure that you've got what you need in order to be successful, and this type of course does, does that for you. It does increase your self-confidence. If you've never stood in front of a group, um, it can be very intimidating, and we, we walk you through a step-by-step -step process to get you comfortable in front of a group of people and, and basically managing that group of people. Um, it improves your communication and presentation skills because you're up front here, and you have to figure out how to, how to command the room. And it gives you an opportunity to practice teaching in a safe environment. So we have a step-by-step -step way to get you comfortable. So first of all, you start by uh, teaching your peers, so the other people in the class. We have what's called micro-teaching. Then you uh, go into Lisa's classes and you observe. You see what the teachers there are doing. And then you get paired with some of Lisa, one of Lisa's teachers, and that teacher um, gradually gives you more and more responsibility with his or her class. And then you work up to the point where you teach an entire class. So it's a really safe step-by-step -step way of doing it. We don't just kind of throw you in the deep end and say start teaching, and then watch and be entertained by it. Um, so yeah, so it's very it's a very safe way to do it. Um, a TESOL certificate really increases your marketability as a teacher. Okay? In today's world, you really cannot get a job without one, and it gives you a professional credential. It says I take myself seriously as an English language teacher. Okay? So quite a few reasons uh, to to look at taking a course. There are many TESOL courses out there. Okay? You've probably gotten brain freeze looking at all of the different courses that are out there. So what you want to look for, whether you take this course or not, you always want to look for whether a course is accredited. That means that a third party organization has looked at the course, they've looked at the course content, the assessments, the trainers, the facilities, and they have said these are, these are quality um, features of this course. And the way you do that is if it has either this logo, or there's another logo, I'll show you in a second. In Canada, this is the stamp of quality for a course, so always look for this logo. If it doesn't have this, don't waste your money. Okay? And so to get this logo, the minimum you have to have is 100 hours of classroom instruction, a 20-hour practice teaching piece, and then you have to study grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, teaching the four language skills, lesson planning, classroom techniques. And this will qualify you to teach in most locations in Canada and also internationally. So if you want to teach internationally, this is the accreditation that you look for. Um, the answer is no, but yes. So once you get this course, you've got it. Okay? And nobody can take your qualification away from you. But in Canada, we have something called professional certification. So you can take the certificate you get from us and you take it to TESOL Canada and you say, I'd like professional certification and validation. And then they, they, they look at your file and they do that for you. And you have to um, renew that every year. You just have to renew your membership every year to keep that current. Yeah. 
So it's a no and a yes. Yeah, it's a really good question. So some employers, I'm just going to back up if I can here. So some employers want you to do the TESOL Canada professional certification step. Other employers just need you to show us the certificate that we give you. Okay. So when you're looking at, a, at an organization for employment, you, you need to ask, okay, do I need professional certification or can I just show you my certificate? And so depend, it all depends on the employer. I mean, generally what the law is there, like they do need, they do need that? Stuff. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's probably about 50-50. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just the key is where do you want to work? Okay. Phone them and ask them. Okay. Yeah. So what, what, what does the field assistant board have? So suppose, you know, we get uh, students from multi cultural uh, countries. Yeah. They come in in mid-year, like end of the year, and they don't speak English. Yeah. Some of the kids, even in high schools. So what, they, what does field assistant board ask for? Yes. Uh, okay, so if you want to teach kids yes. in the kindergarten through grade 12 system, this course is no good. Okay. Um, because they had, teaching kids has a completely different certification process. Even in high school? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you have to do um, an undergraduate degree, and then you have to do a Bachelor of Education, and then you have to get approval by the Ontario College of Teachers. Well, I am OCT teaching. Yeah, That's so, so, yeah, so if you're... Can I join if you're an OCT already, yes. they have their own ESL qualification. It's okay. called ESL Level 1 okay. and ESL Level 2 and 3. Okay. Yeah. So does this course uh, provide for that? No. Oh, no. You have to go to either a faculty of education or the union also offers the courses. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you're looking to teach kids in Canada, yes. this will not help. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're the, looking for AQs, additional yes. qualifications. Yeah, additional oh, qualifications. Okay. Yeah. Then in Ontario, because Ontario is special, um, we have a second accreditation system, and it's called, it's with our provincial organization called TESOL Ontario, and it's a slightly longer course that you have to take. Um, so instead of 100 hours, it's 250 hours of instruction, 50 hours of practice teaching. It includes almost all of the same content, but a lot more theory as well, okay? And if you want to teach in Ontario in the government funded programs, boards of education, some community colleges and some universities, not all of them, um, you need to take this second level of course. Okay? This is only in Ontario. If you want to go out to teach in Alberta, you just need the, the, the TESOL Canada one. If you want to teach in Ontario in these government funded programs, you need this one. Okay? So is that, can I start with the, if I finish the first program? Can I continue this program, or do yes. I have to start from the very beginning? It's a really good question, and we've designed our course to, you, you start with the first one, and then you continue and you do a second one. So our first course is 100 hours. Mm -hmm. Our second course is 150 hours, which brings you to your 250. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so what a lot of people do is they take the first one, and they get out, go out and teach for a few years in private schools, or they go internationally, and then they come back, and they take the second one because they want to work in government-funded programs, for example. Um, and then this is the professional certification I was talking about. So well, first you successfully complete the course, and then if your employers need it, you get either TESOL Canada certification or TESOL Ontario certification. And you require TESOL Ontario, right? Yes, we yes. do. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to work here, you have to do the professional certification piece. And there's a fee associated with these. Um, yeah. So if I have just uh, Ontario certification, so can I teach in uh, Yes, you can. Because what um, the Tesla Ontario uh, accreditation is equivalent to the level two for Canada. So the level one for Canada is 100 hours. The level two for Canada is 250 hours. So yes, yeah, you can take that Tesla Ontario anywhere in Canada. Yeah. If you're going internationally, the Tesla Ontario one is not very useful, but you can take it anywhere. Okay, so the a we've got a two-part program, as I mentioned. So our ACE TESOL certificate is the TESOL Canada standard. So it's 100 hours of instruction, 20 hours of practice teaching. Here we offer it part-time in a blended approach, which we'll talk more about. Um, it's a very practical course, so we kind of we jump right in with all the practical aspects of teaching. Um, 
Lisa, Lisa has a great group of very professional and very qualified trainers here. Um, just an awesome group of trainers that you're working with. And this is recognized by Tesla Canada. And it is the first step if you want to go on and do the Tesla Ontario piece as well. Okay. So the content in the course is, as I said, very practical. We do a tiny little bit of theory, but then we do a lot of practical stuff. Um, lesson planning, testing, how do you teach grammar, vocabulary, how do you teach pronunciation, how do you teach the language skills. We also have a, a module on managing your career, so how you um, can progress in your career. And the methodology, it's a blended approach, so there's partly online and partly in the classroom. When you're in the classroom, you're doing a lot of, my voice is about to go, <coughs> you do a lot of pair work, it's small group work, discussions, debate. Online, you're doing, um, you're doing your reading, you're doing research on different websites, we have online quizzes that you complete, videos that you watch, and so on there. Um, and you've got worksheets for all of the modules that you complete, and you, that's part of how we assess you as well. I don't think we updated the assessment on this. Oh, I did, huh. Okay, so we assess you in quite a few different ways. Okay. So we assess you with an observation report. You go into Lisa's classes and then you write a report on what you see. Okay. Um, online quizzes, you create what's called a learning journal where you complete a lot of worksheets and put it all together into a journal. Um, you create a lesson plan portfolio, a sample of seven lessons that you've created. Uh, you do micro teaching, which is your peer teaching. And then finally, when you're working with one of Lisa's teachers, you're doing evaluated solo teaching. Okay. So a lot of different ways that we assess you. Just because you pay your money doesn't mean you pass. You actually have to prove that you meet, meet the standards. Okay. And then the part two, so to get you to that Tesla Ontario piece, we've got another 150 hours of instruction. And this is once again blended. So some of this is in the classroom, some of it's online. We've got another 30 hours of practice teaching. Okay. And it's offered part-time in a blended format here. Once again, it's very practical, task-based, and participatory, and once again, a great group of trainers. And this is recognized by Tesla Ontario. And the course content, this one has the theory in it. So we, we put all of our theory into our part two. So we take you through how we learn first and second languages. We look at language and culture, language and society. And then we add more practical stuff, advanced teaching skills, um, we work with something called the Canadian Language Benchmarks, which is a language proficiency framework um, that was developed here in Canada. We teach you how to assess language, we teach you how to design courses, and then we teach you more theory on linguistics, morphology, phonology. It's all actually much more exciting than it, than it sounds. <laughs> it was funny, I was talking with a bunch of friends of mine that I did this course with uh, like 20-some 20, 20 years ago, and. We started do, doing a sentence analysis in this video conference call, and we're like, okay, we're really geeky here, because <laughs> we get so into this stuff. So once you learn this, you, you can start analyzing people's language, and you can have a lot of fun with it. And people think you're weird, but it's really fun. <laughs> uh, the methodology, very similar to the certificate course. So when you're doing the classroom part, you're doing a lot of pair work, small group work, discussions, debate. Online, once again, you've got online quizzes, you've got learning journals, you've got websites that you're researching, videos that you're watching, and so on. And the assessment is very similar. Observation report, online quizzes, learning journal, and once again, an evaluated solo teaching with a higher standard. So when you do this part, you have to meet a higher standard in order to pass. Um, do you want to talk about the practicum? Sure. Uh, so, off the certificate course, uh, it has a 20-hour practicum. The 20-hour practicum is split into six hours of observation in the classes. So you go into the classes, you observe, you complete some notes, and then you complete your observation report. But that's kind of a good introduction to what is happening in the classes. Then you commit to one class and one instructor for the remainder of the 20 hours, 14 hours altogether. And that is divided into, as Diane mentioned earlier, strategic steps in terms of your own practicum where you lead up to a solo teaching session right at the end. Uh, and then you're evaluated by the mentor instructor who you've spent the 14 hours with. And it's all very gentle. Mm -hmm. We have practice evaluations along the way. Um, it's very open and transparent, so by the end of your teaching practicum, there shouldn't be any surprises in terms of what is required and likely how you will be evaluated at the end. 
And then the diploma is very similar, uh, but as Diane mentioned, it's kind of higher stakes. The evaluation form will be similar to the certificate, uh, but again, you're expected to step it up a little bit at that stage since you've already been through all the prior training. So what we do is we introduce you to the theory and the lesson planning, but alongside of that, we try to get you into the classrooms to get a real feel for what's happening and then get you comfortable eventually with one class and the learners and the instructor and then hopefully by the end of your practicum for the certificate and the diploma, then you'll be, you'll be good to go. Yeah. And you offer practicums at multiple locations, right? Yes, yeah. so this is the biggest location that we have. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, we have morning, afternoon, evening, and Saturday classes. So usually we can find a class to meet your schedule, whether you're working or not. Uh, we also have two other Brampton adult education centers, and they also have the same schedule. Um, one of them offers Saturday classes as well. So if you're living in Brampton and you can only commit on a Saturday, then often we can we can accommodate that too. So what we do whenever you join the class, we ask you to fill out a preference form to indicate your schedule for practicum, even though that's a few weeks away. And then we try as best we can to accommodate that in terms of location and time. Okay. And, and just one thing to stress too, once you've been assigned your practicum supervisor, you kind of have to take over the process. So it's your responsibility to communicate with your, your supervisor, um, make sure that you agree on when you're going to come into the classes, what you're going to teach, and, and what, what uh, activities you're going to do. So you need to kind of step up and manage that relationship once Lisa's established it for you. Thank you. Um, so for people whose first language is not English, remember I mentioned that you needed to demonstrate English language proficiency. So for the certificate, you can either do the TOEFL in IBT or you can do IELTS. Um, for IELTS, it's seven right across the board. Okay. Rachel, you said academic. Uh, thank you. It's academic. Yeah. So you need the academic. Yeah. I checked all my IBTs. In speaking, you mean seven or eight? Um, no, it's seven. Seven. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Okay, I'll check. I don't think they bumped it up, but I'll, I'll double check. Yeah. Um, and then the diploma, or sorry, then you also need an undergraduate degree or established equivalent. Established equivalent means if you did not do your undergraduate degree in Canada, what you have to do is get your degree evaluated. Um, has everyone heard of World Education Services or OCAS? Yeah, so there's different agencies that will evaluate your, your uh, undergraduate degree and indicate it's equivalent to a Canadian one. So you need to do that step as well. And what, it doesn't matter what it's in, you just need to have that equivalency. Um, any subject, you do. And then to go into the second one, the diploma, you have to do the certificate first. Okay. One thing to note, um, this used to be different. I don't know if they've changed it. I'll have to double check. But Tesla Canada and Tesla Ontario used to be different, but I think they've moved them the same now. Yeah, we'll have to double check that. Okay, so just if, if this is you, if you need to prove your language proficiency, you need that for the diploma as well. And can I do it after the course as well or during the course of the course? If you want, if you can't fit it in before the course, we have you sign a waiver saying that you know you need to do it to get professional certification. And the other thing is we do not um, accommodate uh, the, the instruction if you don't understand the instruction. So you need to make sure that your English level is high enough so that you can actually understand what's going on in the class, because we don't accommodate if that's a problem. Okay. And you think language based one doesn't accommodate? No. Okay. No. And uh, it should be like two year old? Yeah, it can't go back more than two years, yeah. Three years? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and I will let Lisa talk about this, because this is the schedule of courses that we have coming up. Okay, so lately we've been offering the both the certificate and the diploma in a blended format, which seems to be working very well. Uh, we have a lot of different people from many different fields, many occupations, and often people are working. Uh, and so the blended format, we only ask that you come out one evening or Saturday morning a week for the duration of the course. So for the certificate, it ends up being a 10-week course. We ask that you come here on a Monday evening for two and a half hours for the 10 weeks. And the rest of the time, it's up to you. It's independent study. Now, it's not a let's leave it all until the 10th yes. week and cram it in because it is the course is staged so so much that we expect you really to do your seven and a half hours every single week to make up for the 75 hours over the ten, the course of the 10 weeks. Um, so a lot of the learning is independent. There's a lot of support available for you. We have online trainers and then we have our in-class trainers. 
Um, so whatever it is you're doing during the week, then you just set up some kind of communication with the online trainer, then follow up in class on a Monday evening for the certificate, depending on um, what the in-class trainer is working on. So you're looking at uh, your 100 hours, basically, of instruction, and then your 20-hour practicum, which would be in one of our classes. Okay? Uh, Do you have books and resources? Uh, they're all included. Yeah. So all of the resources you need to complete the course are available in the online learning management system. And you can keep digital copies of it or you can print copies out, uh, whichever you want to do. So it's all included. And I will double stress and triple stress, you have to commit to at least seven and a half hours of independent work online. Okay? You will have zero sympathy from me or Lisa if you come to the end of the course and you've got 50 hours left to do. Okay? You have to stay on top of that because otherwise it just is a disaster. Okay. Yeah, and there are also, there are also term exams. Um, exams, in as far as we have to call them exams, yeah. um, but they're, you know, they're, they're take-home exams. Mm -hmm. They're not under any kind of exam conditions. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't kept up until yeah. that point, then you know, yeah. you're not gonna benefit your own learning yeah. by not keeping successful. on top of it. Yeah. But, but we have help and support, so. We don't just leave it to you completely. We um, we check in with you, and again, the online trainer is responsible for making sure that he or she connects with you to give you the support um, outside of the classroom. Yeah. Uh, the Mondays, yeah, it is usually we keep it on a Monday evening. We're here on a Monday. I'm here on a Monday evening until nine o'clock, so it usually works out for the best that I can keep an eye on on everybody. Um, and two and a half hours weekly for the ten weeks. Okay. Well, we've been with you. Yes, we are. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. Sometimes there's variation in the calendar whenever we hit Thanksgiving. And, yeah. yeah. Thanksgiving. Thank you for that. Yeah. But I think that's accommodating. I think we have. I've pushed it. Yeah, yeah. I've pushed these dates so that the 25th will take into account uh, kind of the Monday's off. Uh, so, um, we're close here for the next two weeks. Uh, very important. If you're thinking of following up with me next week, Two things. First of all, we have no staff working here. Um, I'm not going to be here either. And the website actually is undergoing a bit of a facelift. So you may find that if you log in one day next week, there may be an error. Uh, that's because we're we're giving the, the web the website a facelift. So just don't panic. Um, I'm back on the 19th. So basically, any questions I haven't been able to answer before that, ask me the week beginning of the 19th. I'll be here full time. And then uh, for the 16th intake, I'm going to say two weeks before that will be the cutoff, the absolute cutoff, because we have to have you into, go through a telephone interview and um, our academic advisor, we need to coordinate with her when she's free to be able to do that with you. So two weeks before this. Yeah. Um, is the 1700 a final cost or is there taxes on top of that? That's it. That's including a $100 application fee. Oh. And how many people will make up a class? Good question. Because it's a blended format, we, it varies how many people we have in the class and outside. We average it at about 12, usually about 12, and there's not typically a huge variation in that. If we doubled up when we got you know, a year when an awful lot of people wanted to register, we would just divide it up and have two in-class sessions, but usually about 12 people. To pass the course yes. or to get into it? To pass it? Yeah, thank you. I forgot to mention that. So in order to pass the course, you need a minimum of 70% on each of the evaluations, and then you get two redos. So if you just have a bad day and uh, you didn't get your 70%, you get two opportunities to redo, and that includes the evaluated solo teaching you can redo. So the kind of the passing mark is 70%. Okay, so that includes your uh, class assessments and the... Yeah. Yeah, you have to get 70% on each assessment. It's not an average of 70, it's oh. each assessment. Yeah. And then if you don't, then you get two redo opportunities. Yeah. And attendance is 90%. 90%, 90%. yeah. So if you're finding that you're missing three weeks worth yeah. of classes, then you're gonna run into a little bit of trouble. Because you can't, you can't make that up. Yeah. You know? Can you enter as a mature student? Um, basically, everyone in the class is All a mature of, yeah. student. Pretty yeah. much, yeah. 
Do you mean without the qualifications, or do you mean? Like, say, for example, you didn't attend university. Uh, okay. Yes, you can, um, but you have to sign a waiver saying that you know that getting an, uh, getting employment will be challenging, and I'll be very upfront, it will be. So there are opportunities um, in some of the international markets, for example, China, Europe, a little bit Central South America. Um, there are no opportunities in Canada. That undergraduate degree is the minimum. Yeah. You might might find the certification challenging. The professional certification will be a challenge. Yeah. You know, uh, because they will they will ask for it if you need university degree. We do have some people without university degrees taking it, but we usually want to do it so that they can volunteer and, and, and something like that. But um, they can't. So how long did it take to get the professional certification? After the uh, first certification, how long did it take to what, the gap between the professional certification and the dual certification? Yeah, so we produce your certificates usually four weeks after the end of the course, provided we get your practicum results. So we need all of the results in. And then the application process for professional certification, if you have everything ready to go, it's between four and eight weeks yeah, once you send it in. And there's also a piece of yeah, there are fees involved, but they don't get paid to, to the appeal board, they get paid directly to the uh, accrediting organization. So either Tesla Canada or Tesla Ontario. Yeah. Do you know by chance how much the fee or the... I can't remember the fees. I'm, I'm going to say the Tesla Ontario was, is up to about $130 at yeah. this stage. The can Tesla Canada, is it 90 I think it's about 90 I think yeah. it is. Yeah. But just yeah. uh, check on their websites and you'll find it. Yeah. So do, do we have to write the exam with the certificate? No. No, what you have to do, uh, to get your professional certification, you have to um, send a, a notarized version of your transcript or your original undergraduate degree. And then um, if English is not your first language, you need to send your test scores, and then you need to send an original of your certificate from us. Yeah, yeah. but there's no exam. No. So remember that, sorry, those organizations certify us yeah. to offer this training. So as long as you have completed the training and have been successful with us, then Tesla Canada and Tesla Ontario will want to see proof of that. Yeah. Yeah. So with the professional certification, you have to renew your membership every year, and then and then for Tesla Ontario, you have to demonstrate um, ten hours of professional development every year. Tesla Canada, you just have to renew your membership every year. Yeah. And so Tesla Canada's membership renewal is about thirty dollars every year. Um, and I don't know if there's an additional certification renewal, but um, yeah, so it's an it's an annual renewal process. So then you have to get one renewal. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you don't have to be submitted. The professional so, development. Yeah. So what what do you mean by that? Ten hours of professional development. Yeah. Year? Yeah. So they want you to do things like attend conferences or attend webinars, uh, mentor other teachers, uh, volunteer with the organization. Anything that uh, says that you're keeping up your professional learning. Yeah, taking courses. Okay, and then diploma schedule. So the diploma is very similar. Uh, there's a lot of independent online study, a considerable amount more than the certificate. And then uh, Saturdays we find have been uh, suitable for most people to come in. Again, here we run ESL classes on a Saturday, so there's lots of people in the building. Um, and the same thing happens two and a half hours for 15 weeks, and you get a chance to collaborate with the group um, go over the concepts that you've been studying online yourself during the week and keep on track in terms of what's expected throughout the course of the 15 weeks. You've got a that's... typo there. That should be Saturdays, not Mondays. Oh, Saturday. yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the in-class portion is subject to a little bit of flexibility depending on the group. So if we have 12 people in the group and five of them work on Saturdays, we can always try and find a more accommodating evening or time to have the in-class portion. So, uh, what about this uh, online uh, diploma? Is it uh, like you go to the webinar or what you do? Uh, no, what it is is you access our learning management system and then the course is divided into modules and each module has um, what we call lecture notes and then um, tasks that you have to complete and sometimes there's videos or websites that you have to look at. So there's no live webinars, so you don't have to check in online at a certain day or time. Mm -hmm. um, it's all self-paced, but you have to keep up on a weekly basis. Yeah. 
Um, just some websites for you to look at. Um, there's career web career resources at this website. This is a website that we maintain. It's got things like sample resumes, all of the uh, language recruiting organizations, teacher recruiting organizations, um, all kinds of information about building a career. Um, and then this is the TESOL Canada website. This is the accrediting organization for the certificate. And, oh, I didn't have TESOL Ontario on here. Um, Languages Canada is the organization for all the private language schools. So if you want to see what the opportunities are there, um, for private language schools, go there. TESOL is a global organization. Um, if you're looking for some international jobs, there's a lot of US jobs there as well. And then IATEFL is another international organization out of the UK. But if you want to check out jobs, um, go here. Um, and with TESLAontario dot, what is it, dot org, yes. I forgot to put the Tesla Ontario one, but it's just www.teslontario.org. Anyone can check out that. Yeah, this is about uh, like that employment type of situation because this is a post of something like your choice of name. So, uh, what are the incomes of the the employment? Uh, what are the chances uh, in Canada or especially in North America? Yeah, it varies. Um, the interesting thing is that sometimes one part of the sector will have good employment and another part won't. So um, it's, it depends on the part. Um, so for example, five years ago, there were almost no jobs in the government funded programs, uh, but there were lots of jobs at the college and university level. There's always jobs at the private language school level. Uh, the government funding one varies depending on which government's in power and kind of where they're allocating their funds. So it, it varies considerably. Um, so the best thing to do is uh, when you're coming towards the end of a course, just check in with your trainers and ask them for ideas on where the jobs are right now, where the market is. Um, and then this is a good place to go for where, where opportunities are as well. There are no guarantees. We can never guarantee, okay, finish this course, you'll get a job because we have no control over a lot of the, the supply and demand dynamics, unfortunately. Um, but we put you in touch with the different uh, websites where you'll find job postings and uh, connect you with jobs that we know. We send out a, an alumni or graduate newsletter every month, and so any job opportunities that we get, become aware of, we, we send them out to you every month as well. Yes? Okay, so for the diploma course, and I went to last year, um, I have a CELTA. Yeah. And so how does that relate to what if I just want to go right to the diploma? Yes, you can go right into the diploma. You just have to show us a copy of your CELTA. So the CELTA is considered equivalent to our certificate. Yep. Okay, so if you have any more any questions, that's how you reach Lisa. And don't don't phone Cindy, because she'll just forward it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so can I just ask, you may have questions, but for those of you who've been here before, and I see a lot of familiar faces, um, Kind of six months on, what are your thoughts? You know, what do you what what has stopped you from taking a course like this, or what has kept you coming back for more information? So, what are what are we missing in terms of helping you decide at this point? No. For me, it's like uh, I have the uh, been here for uh, I think it was like three months before, so. I think like what I will decide is because I have kind of like academic uh, eyes because I don't have I have a general eyes with me so I have to go for an academic because I love India and for uh, you know my all degrees and everything is in English but still they people don't recognize a, the Indian I mean uh, yeah the English language is there because uh, then I have to go for eyes academic so that's the part which you know yeah. I think yeah. And it's it's very common. So we yeah. have a lot of participants who, if during the process of their application, they double check about the IELTS. Mm -hmm. Some participants join the course and they don't have their IELTS, but they understand joining that they will need to get it in order to receive professional certification. So. And it actually also helps you with employment because, and because you're actually one of the jobs you can get actually is helping students prepare for IELTS. Mm -hmm. So if you've done it. Um, you can act, you're actually very effective in helping you prepare yeah. for it. You've kind of been in their shoes. Yeah. Yeah. So they can join the course like uh, the 
one items and to also the confusion with the unique items. Yes, yeah. But if you join it without IELTS, you need to understand that we're not making any accommodation. So if you don't think if you don't think you're either at or very, very close to that IELTS seven, I strongly recommend you do the IELTS first and find out where you are. Um, because what we don't want is we don't want you taking the course and then you try multiple, multiple times to get the IELTS and you can't, and then you, you have kind of wasted your investment in the course. So, you know, if you it's a good idea just to find out if you're close, at least, yeah. Oh, I just yeah. want to know, uh, are you sending the video IELTS to us as well, or is it just for the online? Um, if Lisa has your email address, so we can send you the link for the video. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm so sorry. I just have to go. No, that's okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very and much. And you can always that. email me and remind me. I will. Here. I will. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Actually, we're basically... We're good. Yes. Yeah. So. Any other questions? Is there a timeline after I No, but you can do your professional certification without it, and you also will probably need it to get employment. So you want to get it, if you're going to do the course first and IELTS second, you want to get the IELTS as soon as possible after the course, because that's going to be a barrier to, to you getting employed as well. My questions are always money related. So do you guys have a payment plan, or do you take everything in full? So we, the, the simple question is no, we don't have a payment plan. Uh, we do ask that the fees are paid up front before the course starts. Okay. We can have a conversation. If anybody wants to have a chat about payment, I'm always available to do that. And you issue a tax receipt, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. So it is tax deductible. Yes. So what could they get to with the plan procedure? The plan procedure? Yeah. A conversation with me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we figure it out. Yes. Sheet paper. Oh. <laughs> I have my transcripts, but I never credential in less and any other. And it's about five years later, so I need to get again my transcript from back home. Or have you had it evaluated? No. Uh, but you've got the actual transcript. Yes, it's original and. And is, is it certified as original? Yes. Then yeah, you're fine. So you just have to just I, submit in the. the yeah, I don't either. think that will work now because things have changed. Because they won't take the you know, send any transcripts from you. She has to get it directly from the Oh, yeah, yeah. So they mean sales yeah. transcripts. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. 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 So that's okay. So we have to get it sent directly from the university. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank so we need to do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Get it directly from the university. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can't give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's so fine for us for admission with us yeah. mm -hmm. in the course, but for professional certification. Yeah. And for getting the equivalency. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for coming out. Um, we'll be hanging around, so if you have any other questions, feel free to come and ask them. And uh, Remember everybody, so the end of this week, Peel is on vacation, so <laughs> you know, the teachers have got to have a vacation at some yeah. stage, yes. so the next two weeks will be very quiet. Um, if you have any questions, if you can try to get them into me before the end of this week, then I will try my best to get back to you. Otherwise, sit tight, and then August 19th, we'll be open for business. But can we start the registration process? Also? Yes, you can. Actually, very. thank you for reminding me about that. It is all done online, uh, so if you're good to go, you can start the application process. It's all very clear online, and you pay your $100, and then once we see that you've applied initially, then we get in touch and we start the, the process from there. Okay? Okay, thank, okay, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you. So much. I just saw that. Hang on, just two seconds here. Let me just... Thank you.